And Buddha compares mindfulness to a gatekeeper, one who knows who to let in and who not to let in. And this is a gatekeeper at a fortress at the edge of a country on the frontier. And so there are a lot of people who you do not want to let into that fortress. Basically greed, aversion, and delusion. And you do let in skillful meta qualities. Right view all the way down through right concentration. So it's not simply a matter of being open and accepting of everything that comes by or comes up or comes in. There's another place where the Buddha defines mindfulness as the ability to remember, to keep in mind, he said, what was said and done long ago. So how does that apply to what you're doing right now? Well, you're here with a purpose. You're trying to get the mind to settle down. As the Buddha said, the practice of right concentration is the heart of the path, and all the other factors are its, a, its requisites or its helping factors. And mindfulness is what helps you to remember what you've learned about the path, both from what you've heard and from what you've experienced as you've practiced. Lessons about what works, what doesn't work. And as the Buddha says, you keep reminding yourself that with regard to each of the factors of the path, if you detect that something unskillful is coming up, you want to abandon it. If something skillful is coming up, you want to encourage it. And if it's not coming up, you try to give rise to it. So basically you're remembering what you want to do. Because after all, the mind is doing things all the time. Whatever comes in by way of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind goes through a lot of different steps in the processes of your actually experiencing it. A lot of filters, some of which you could compare them to a radio, turn up the volume, and other filters turn down the volume. Focus your attention here, focus it there. And since you're already doing this kind of fabrication, what the path is is a way of teaching you how to fabricate in more skillful ways. So the purpose of mindfulness is to remind you how you want to fabricate, what you're going to do right now. You've got a whole hour here you sit and focus on the breath. And you can make all kinds of different experiences out of it. I had a woman one time who brought a friend of hers to meditate with us. And at the end of the hour, it was one of those really nice days, we're sitting out in the outdoor classroom under the trees, the gentle breeze, the temperature was nice. And at the end of the hour, the friend opened her eyes and said, I have never suffered so much in my life just sitting there breathing. Of course, it wasn't just that she was sitting there breathing. Her mind was racing through all kinds of things, adding a lot of unnecessary suffering. The friend in the meantime, the woman who had brought her in the meantime, had had a really nice meditation, again, sitting, watching her breath. So it shows you the different ways you can take basically what is the same experience and turn it into all kinds of different things. And because we have so many habitual ways of shaping our experience, it's good to remember the Buddha's instructions or the Buddha's recommendations. I ran across someone today who was saying that trying to get back to the Buddha's original words is fundamentalism and literalism, and we don't want that. It's bad for us somehow. Well, it's just simply a matter of accurate reporting. We want to know what he said. I mean, the question always is, would you like to have your words twisted? Well, no. Then why would we want to twist the Buddha's words? What do you think he would think about this? 
And also some people say, well, I want to have my own meaning that I extract from the text. I mean, that's perfectly fine. But at least give the text a fair hearing. And remember, his texts are not the sort of things that the postmodernists get all upset about, i.e., the author is trying to impose a definition of you on you that pins you down or makes you the object of that person's thought. The Buddha is offering you tools by which you can look at the way you define yourself and the way you create suffering for yourself and ways in which you can learn how not to create that suffering. It's about as compassionate a text as you can find. And if you want to extract some other meaning out of it aside from the quest to put an end to suffering, that's your, that's your choice. But it's like trying to impose a, your own meaning, say, on a medical textbook, deciding that you, you like kidney disease. Or you like lung disease, or you don't like a particular treatment, regardless of whether it works. So it is good to remember what the Buddha said and put it to the test. Okay, just the fact that it's in the text doesn't mean it's going to work, but give it a fair hearing, give it a fair try, and try to develop the qualities of mind that allow you to give it. a fair test, a fair judgment. So you want to be alert, you want to be discerning. And those are some of the things that we're trying to develop as we, hear, as we practice here, the qualities of alertness, qualities of discernment. Notice when you focus on the breath, what, what happens to the breath. As soon as you focus on it, you're going to be changing it. Focus on any part of the body, and you're going to change that part of the body. So are you focusing in a way that's going to help it get better, or is it going to be in a way that's going to create more problems? And are you focusing in a way that allows the mind to see things clearly, or are you missing things? What you're doing right now makes a huge difference as to how you're going to read the results of the practice, and how you're going to create those results to begin with. So it's a, one of those paradoxes that the development of qualities that helps put an end to suffering is also the development of qualities that allows you to assess whether you really are putting an end to suffering. Because the more sensitive you are to how things work, the more you're going to be able to see where you're still causing subtle levels of stress in the mind. So these are some of the things you want to keep in mind, that your focus does make a difference, where you focus, how you focus, and then what you do with the sensations that arise. Try to focus in a way that gives rise to a sense of well-being, refreshment. The factors of John include pleasure and rapture. And rapture is one of those words that can cover all kinds of phenomena, from very gentle to very intense. The word bitti literally means drinking in. So what kind of sensation would you like to drink in right now? One way of developing that sense of refreshment is to think of it as a kind of fullness. Allow your hands to relax in different parts of the body so that when you breathe in, you're not squeezing those parts of the body and you're not pushing or pulling on them. You just allow them, the sensations that are there just to be there. And if there's a sense of fullness that comes, basically it's the blood allowed into those areas. Allow it just to stay there and then think of that sense of fullness spreading around. Look after the breath, look after the sensations in the body in a way that allows that fullness to maintain itself and to gradually grow. It starts out being pretty gentle, but if you give it enough space and allow it enough space continually, it can develop into something really pleasant, really nourishing. 
because it's that sense of fullness and refreshment that really is food for the mind. That's a passage in the Dhammapada where they say, we feed on rapture like the radiant gods. This is how you do it. And then just try to keep that in mind, that this is what you're going to allow as you sit here. Try not to push or pull or force things too much. As John Fung used to say, if we could push our way into nirvana, everybody would have pushed in their way a long time ago. It requires a very subtle and gentle touch. And there's the quality of persistence, which means that you keep at it. But it doesn't mean you keep pushing yourself up against the wall. You find something good and you stick with it. This is where the quality of respect for concentration comes in, because it's so easy to think, well, I can do this any time, I'll just re leave it for the time being and go out and think for a while about this, that, or the other thing. And you come back and you've lost it. And then the fact that you've lost it starts eating away at you, so it gets harder to get back into it again. So try to maintain it while you can. Give rise to it, let it be there, stay there, let it grow. And mindfulness is what protects this. It protects you from wandering away and protects other things from coming in. Because you remind yourself, this is where you want to stay. You want to develop this quality here. It may not seem like much to begin with, but all the important things in the path start out that way. It's not much to begin with, but you give it a chance to grow. And when it has a chance to grow, then it shows its potential, many times in ways that you might not have expected. So it's in this way that mindfulness becomes a theme for concentration. You keep certain ideas in mind of what you want to do, and then you do them. Keep on doing them. Keep on protecting the good results that you've gotten. You don't forget. So remember, we're not here just to be accepting and open for everything that comes by. We have our agenda. We are trying to put an end to suffering. We are trying to develop the path. That's a good agenda. There does come a point eventually when you let go of the path, but let it do its work first. The path is one thing, the goal is something else. If you look after the path, the path will take you to the goal. So give it a chance.